Hey guys, decided to bring the spinoff show back for this episode for today because I just had a lot on my mind. Um, this is Anthony from the Jock and Nerd podcast and the, the whole George Floyd uh, getting senselessly murdered in the streets by a cop and, and the fallout from that with the riots and the protesting and the divide in this country and the discussion about race, police brutality, white privilege, all the things that have come out of this. There's just been so much on my mind and I've been looking for an outlet to, to have a discussion and I have a podcast called the spinoff show, uh, part of the jock and nerd podcast. And, and I thought to myself, this is probably the place to do it. That would work for me. And, and I know these conversations should be or, or happen in private but in this case, I wanted to to have it publicly and to put it out there just for anyone to listen to. On the show, I had on my my really good friend, uh, one of my best friends, Justin Cappadocia, who is a visual storyteller in, in Chicago, done projects for a lot of major brands. But he's also one of my really good friends, as I mentioned, and, and we have really good talks. And I thought it was important to have him on. Along with that, I had on TJ Johnson, who's been on the podcast a couple times. He's one of the hosts from Voice from the Underground. Admittedly, he, he is a black guy, and I respect his opinion, and I wanted to have the perspective of a black man on this show because I thought that was important to the conversation. And he's part of the the Voice from the Underground, like I mentioned, which is a politics and pop culture show. So he's a little bit more versed in talking about uh, issues when it comes to race, politics, all those things. And I felt that perspective, as again, I mentioned, was important. So we just had a conversation about what's going on in America, how we can get better. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Take a listen and let me know what you think. This is the Jock Spinoff Show. So guys, we are here and uh, we're doing a podcast all of a sudden. The spinoff show is back and I'm here with one of my really good friends, if not one of my best friends, Justin Cappadocia, who's a visual storyteller and does a lot of things. And then we got on a returning guest, TJ Johnson from Voice from the Underground. Guys, welcome. Que paso? Que paso? Is that what's Hola. up for my non-Spanish speaking friends? Is yeah, that a hello? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Okay. There you go. You got gotcha. It. <laughs> cool. Uh, and he hello. just said hello. Hello. There you go. <laughs> America, <here>. English. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, here <laughs> <we> go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so just a quick, just kind of a quick intro to why I decided to do this and what the background was. So. I've been in may- meaning to do a show with Justin, who's one of my good friends, for the longest time. And we've debated topics. And the latest one we settled on was doing either Oscars or the movies. And then all this stuff happens. And I'm like, no, this, we're not doing the movies anymore. We're, we're, we're talking about some real stuff. And then I messaged Justin. He's like, yeah, I'm in. And I told him, hey, you know, would you mind if TJ came on? And Justin's apparently listened to our, a couple of our shows or one of our shows together. And I was like, yeah, TJ would be great. So then I email, messaged TJ. And TJ right away was like, I'm in. So oh, absolutely. here we are. To talk about things, talk about you know the weather and stuff. No, just kidding. Um, we'll talk about what's going on in the world. Um, just kind of, I want to start with opening thoughts. We'll just jump right into it because it's kind of taken over everything. The reason why I wanted to start this is number one, I think it's important to have conversations. Um, but number two, um, I was on Voice from the Underground last Monday. Mm-hmm. Was what's the date on that? TJ, did you listen to that show? You weren't on it. I didn't know. I didn't listen to it. No. Great, Tony. Uh, Tony, you're not that important. You're not that important. <laughs> well, it's it's his own show. <laughs> I never um, listen to my show. If it makes you feel that, better, I even yeah, yeah, I don't listen I don't to my listen show to either. It, yeah. <laughs> um, Monday, May 25th, they, I was on with Big Haas and and Jason Dutch, and they brought up uh, the George Floyd thing that it, it what had happened, and I think that was like the day after it happened. I'm not 100 percent sure, but they brought it up in context with. Uh, this lady in Central Park trying to call the cops on this African American man, and then this Karen uh, <laughs> getting all pissed off at some Latinos playing Latin music and not American music. 
So it was kind of lumped in with these three things, and I didn't know right. about it. I, I wasn't really aware. So when they brought it up, unfortunately, my reaction was nothing, if not just like, oh, it happened again. Like, it just happened again. Like that, this is as if I was used to it. And then as the days came, went by and the protests started happening and you saw, I saw the video, I was like, holy crap, like, I had no idea this happened and I looked like an idiot because I didn't know what to say. And my reaction was, oh, it happened again. Like, I didn't realize that this all would blow up. So I've been stewing and like reading, researching and just trying to figure out, kind of comprehend everything that's going on. Um, but I'll start with you guys and just go, you know, we can go with Justin, who's never done a podcast, apparently. Um, just some thoughts opening on where your head's at on, on all this stuff. Um, I'll give a 30 second elevator pitch, just like overall, like where it's been. So um, when it comes to COVID, my wife is a doctor dealing with that directly just over the weekend uh, dealt with a uh, death from COVID uh, people flying in and then driving into the city. Uh, I live in River North, and so on Saturday, Chicago Saturday those. afternoon, yeah, Chicago, River North, Chicago, and we were like right in the midst of all of the protesting. The first night of uh, independent of the protesters, the looters, and the rioting, and uh, the mayor reacting. So that's kind of my elevator pitch of like where uh, temperature check where I'm at. And then just yesterday, my company did its uh, first round of layoffs. Um, and schedule reductions. And so that's kind of where my head's and, and my life space has been at. Well, um, TJ? Uh, well, for me personally, uh, I'm from Chicago originally, uh, currently living in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, whew. So with COVID-19, obviously, this is something that kind of hit us all uh, very suddenly um, and very very, very impactfully from the standpoint of we, we weren't prepared. You know, this, this really kind of caught us all with our pants down for lack of a better term. Um, COVID for me personally has hit uh, hard because I've had a, a couple of relatives now um, who have um, tested positive for COVID. Uh, I've had one that recovered completely and one that's, that's working to recover, but it's hit a lot closer to home than I really uh, thought. And then obviously, with the things that have happened with, uh, uh, and it wasn't just George Floyd. Uh, we've had multiple, multiple, multiple things right. happen. Um, Ahmad is another one that happened to, and Brianna Taylor, Brianna and Taylor. Taylor. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm to be honest with you, Tony, I, I think your reaction is relatively fair. And I say it, I say it to say, I say it because of this. It seems to be so commonplace now where a headline reads blah, blah, blah happens to black person or black guy or, you know, another black guy has been slain another black guy has been detained for whatever. It's, 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 it's pretty commonplace to where you can become numb to something like that. Um, yeah. while obviously this, this, this death has struck a particular chord with the African American community. Um, it's not the first. So I don't think that, I know why you were, you know, felt bad about your initial reaction. Um, but the truth be told, it, it, it's easy to become numb to this kind of thing because it happens so frequently and there's so little that's done about it that it, 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 it does. It makes you become a little numb. Like for me personally, as, as frustrated as I am, as, uh, especially not having a son, I have to try to teach my son, uh, how to grow up in a world that doesn't particularly like him. And it's not particularly for him. And, you know, I have a, a, a nine-year-old daughter who is, is chocolate. You know, she's, she's darker than I am and who just loves everybody. You can't, she hasn't met a person she hasn't become friends with. So the idea that at some point, someone will disappoint her. At some point, someone will break her heart from the standpoint of, I don't like you simply because you are who you are, you know, that's, that's, that's a mind numbing thing to have to do. You know, we already, as parents, we already have tough enough jobs uh, from a standpoint of trying to teach our children, you know, the intricacies of life and the birds and the bees and, you know, how to become friends with somebody. Just so many things Like I, I shouldn't have to teach my child how to 
um, not get arrested. You know, I shouldn't have to teach my child how to make it home from a traffic stop alive. I, sh- I shouldn't have to teach my child, you know, exactly how you hold your hands on the steering wheel. You turn on the uh, interior lights. You wind your windows down. Like th- there's a there's a list of things that I have to give. I have to teach my son just for him to be able to make it home at the end of the day. You know, and that's something that no parent should have to really. While you want to teach your son and your, your children how to do things in life. There are things that you shouldn't have. I don't, I don't. I never dreamed that I have to plan teaching my son that. I plan on the birds and the bees. I plan on those type of conversations. But teaching my children how to make it home, that's not something I was ever immensely prepared to do. Um, so this, this has all been very, very um, discouraging, very, 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 very hurt. Um it's 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 been it's been tough. I mean, I, okay. I don't think there's any easier way to put it. Um, I, I've I have not had to rely on faith nearly as much for anything else in my life. Uh, but as at this point, I'm 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 almost solely just relying on faith, uh, relying on uh, the fact that I, I believe you know that love is going to conquer it. Um, but there's got to be there's got to be change. There's got to be effort. There's got to be so much that goes into it. You know. Uh, Right. It, it, love is not going to be enough. You know, we have to have understanding. We have to start making progressive steps forward instead of just consistently saying thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Well, yep. you know, your thoughts and prayers haven't been helping me thus far, you know, so let's, let's talk about what we can really do as far as actions to, to fix this, you know, and yeah. sometimes you're going to have to, you're going to have to cut out the weeds completely. You got to pull them out root and stem, you know? So, yeah, I, you know, I think it's, I think we we can get to like what an appropriate reaction is or how to help. You know, that, I think these these are all important things to to figure out and discuss, right? Like most people don't don't know how to help, or they you know they they think something on so, a post on social media or maybe a donation or whatever. I we'll, we'll I think we should, we can get into that. Um, I I know you guys both both brought up COVID, and I think COVID has had a, a big role in in kind of all of this. Um, for me. You know, I haven't really brought it up on my show, but I had to bring it up on Voice from the Underground that my, you know, my dad has COVID. He's currently in the hospital. Wow. Um, he's getting better, but it, it was one of those things where, it, you know, I bring up the Voice from the Underground and how I didn't know about that the thing that happened to George Floyd, and I was like, my initial reaction was, oh, it happened again, and then I was thinking about it, and I, I was like, I can't really devote any mental space to this. Like, it's just not important for me. Like, I have, I have my family to think about, you know, I have a mom that doesn't drive and is, is also very susceptible to COVID. So I can't just go out there and put time and effort into something like this. But then all the, the, the protests happen and the riots. And I just realized like, Oh my gosh, it's like, this is, this is huge. Like this is bigger than I even thought it was. And it was creating a reaction that I, that I didn't even really fully understand nor want to, I had to like pay attention. So I guess my my uh, ask of you guys is, you know, what did you guys think of it initially when you first saw it happen, or you, you, if you watched the video, or if you heard about it, and did you realize that it would become this big? I can uh, I can start there. I yep. so in college and in high school, I was actually like very involved in um, just just social activism um, for both the Filipino community and then alongside like the Black community um, and. The one thing I realized, I was also um, in school to become an educator, and my goal was to work in inner cities. That's where I had uh, volunteered a lot uh, with my church. I had uh, done a lot of work with the inner city, and I'd seen a lot of this. And I remember when I actively chose not to become a teacher, um, it was because of all of the issues that were there that were bigger than just the person or the classroom or the school, but it was so widespread and systemic that the change that I wanted to, 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 to give and, and, and to impact like this community and then our nation and this world with was far bigger than me. And like, as like a 19 year old, I got scared. And to your point, Tony, like about being like mentally just drained from the other things that you're dealing with in life. Um, again, relative to each person, like just exhaustion. Um, that was my first right. reaction was like, I just had come from a funeral. Um, and then my, it was my uh, father-in-law's birthday and we had to spend time there. So it was like an emotional roller coaster. And then driving into the city, seeing the, uh, the, the roadblocks, the exits off the highway 
and then literally hearing sirens nonstop throughout the night um, and then turning on the news and realize that there was looting and fires being started and cop cars being, um, you know, lit, lit on fire, graffitied and vandalized, like right outside our, our home. It was a lot. Um, and at that point, I was similar to you, Tony, where like the only thing I could focus on was our safety. Um, our, 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 our building currently has like boarded up, like our, our residential building is boarded up already. Um, all of our, our door people have conceal and carries now. Um, and that's a scary thing to think about. And I couldn't even get beyond that into like where the black community is like, where's what's, what's the state of our nation and all those things. Because like right now it's just with everything that's been going on this 2020, um, it's just, it just, there's just so much. And that's kind of where my head's at. And that's kind of what I'm bringing here. And a lot of where my perspective is going to come from. Um, wow. Yeah. Very, very, uh, very, very similar, uh, obviously, uh, coming from the standpoint of, well, like you said, we, we, we all mentioned COVID, um, and me working in retail, uh, it, it hit me particularly different and I'll, I'll explain why. So, the initial reports about COVID were, oh, it's just an overblown cold. Um, it's flu-like symptoms, but you'll be fine now. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I've, in my 35 years of life, I've never had the flu. I've never, I've gotten, I think I've had maybe one or two flu shots in my life, um, but I've never had the flu virus. Um, so hmm. I can't speak personally about, you know, what a flu would feel like Um but I, I, I just imagine it wouldn't be a huge, huge deal, you know. So I have to admit, I didn't take it very, very seriously from the standpoint of it's like, uh, it's just the flu. It's not going to be a big deal. But then, then you start to you start to learn more about it. You start to see the death tolls. You start to see how it's affected the eastern uh, eastern country. You start to see how it's affected China, how it's affected Italy, and the death the death pile up, pile up, pile up. It's like, okay, we need to start really, you know, paying attention to this, and then. You know, you start seeing it spread. And I, I just think of movies like Contagion or, you know, The Walking Dead, where it starts in one spot and it just becomes it just it just rapidly spreads and you can't stop it. And it, it started to get very, very real to me. And then the idea, the understanding that it affects the older community and um, the people whose immune systems are already compromised. You know, I have a family uh, here in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, who's of age that can be affected by this. And I, I go to work in a retail corporation. Um, so I'm on the front lines every day dealing with people on a consistent basis in regards to, you know, paper towel shortages, tissue shortages, water shortages, sanitizer shortages, rubbing alcohol shortages. Just, and you're not just getting, you know, the normal retail customers. You're getting the anxious, angry, why don't you have enough of this in stock? I need this for my whatever, you know, we have X amount of people that we're caring for. We need to have more than that, than the limit says we do. You know, I'm getting that aspect of it. So I'm getting the, the absolute best shot from people <laughs> in regards to, you know, just giving me the most nastiest response they can give me. And I've gotten some people that have been relatively, uh, been fairly pleasant to me uh, as well. So, um, COVID hit me particularly hard from just the standpoint of, again, uh, just exhausted, exhausted working mentally, the probably, yeah. yeah, just yeah. just uh, mentally exhausted, emotionally spent, physically exhausted. Because again, you're just consistently getting bombarded. That, oh, by the way, my wife is pregnant. That, and by the way, you know, we're expecting a child within the next three to four weeks, and I don't even know if I'll be able to even be in the delivery room because of how serious this COVID nineteen is. Um, so there's a lot of different things. Um, you know, finding out that I have family members who were inflicted with it, and uh. So you have the COVID aspect, right? And then when you see that video, I have to admit, I've never, I haven't watched the entire video through. I, I, I can't, I can't bring myself I to do it. I, I just, I've, I've seen stills. I've seen bits and pieces of the video, but I can't bring myself to fully watch that video for the reason being is that it, it, it it's, it's sickening to the point where I, I can physically feel myself getting flustered. I can physically, even just talking about it now, I physically feel myself just feeling despair um, for this gentleman. Um, and I use that term very, 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 very loosely. Um, but for this gentleman to have his knee 
on George's neck for more than eight minutes. I think it was eight minutes and 26 seconds or something to that effect. Right. Um, and the, 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 the gentleman is pleading for air. You know, I just, I can't breathe. You know, we've seen that. We've seen, I can't breathe before. We've right. seen, um, Eric Garner. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen it happen and we didn't learn anything from it then. And now you have this police officer who's got his knee on this guy's neck and people are standing there watching. Now, granted, you have people that are, you know, telling him, Hey, get your knee off his neck. He can't breathe. He can't breathe. But you have three other police officers standing there watching and allowing this to progress. So as a, as a black man in this country, it shows me that you really just don't care. You right. really just don't care. As a, as a police officer, your job is to de-escalate situations. Your position requires you to have a certain amount of, uh, uh, I don't know what the, the correct word is going to be, but you have to carry yourself a certain way. You have to be able to hold your emotions in check and you have to be able to, to, to do your duty in a calm, de-escalating type manner. Now, obviously, if you have to use force, then you have to use force, but that's not supposed to be your go-to. That's supposed yeah. to be your last resort, right? So you have this this gentleman with his, with his this knee on his neck. He can't breathe. He's explaining to you he can't breathe. He's trying to explain to you the best he can. You're not hearing him. So all it tells me is that you just don't care. And then it just adds to another list, uh, a list of people that we've got to make another hashtag for. Justice for George Floyd. Justice for Ahmaud Arbery. Justice for right. Eric Garner. Justice for Sandra Blanche. Just justice, justice. All these different hashtags. And where have we gotten with the first hashtag? You know, we look at somebody like Colin Kaepernick who took a knee in a peaceful protest about systemic racial injustice and the inequality and violence against African-American men. Mm -hmm. um, he, he took a knee. He obviously, as we all see, and we all know now, you know, his career was essentially blackballed because of it. Right. He was, he was kicked out. He of was NFL. kicked out of the NFL essentially um, for doing exact, for, for doing exactly what people have asked us to do. You know, instead of going out and rioting, eluding, and I don't believe in rioting, eluding. I don't believe in any of that, but I understand the frustration. I don't think that it needs to be destroying buildings and, and vandalizing because what is that really going to prove? However, here's what I will say. If you're more outraged at the, 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 the looting and the rioting than you are at the fact that another African-American man was killed and it took, what, a week to bring him to, to just to just even fire the guy longer than that to actually arrest him. And then they just mm -hmm. decided to arrest the other three. Like, but this all happened because of the fury and the outrage that's been poured out. Um, yeah. It's just, it, it it's a lot, you know, it, it's a lot to, to deal with. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot to di di digest and decompress and try to understand. And it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. You know, I, I think because I want to get into the protests eventually because this that was a, a symptom of this. But I, I think it's important that, you know, we don't the first thing we not we don't focus on is the protests, right? And the riots and looting. I think the first thing we put focus on is is the cause. Right. And this was George Floyd. But what was the cause of this? Right. Um, you know, you mentioned cops. And I think we get we we get more angry when cops do it in general because these are the people that we trust to protect us right so we have these people that are um given this power to you know uphold law and, and be the watchful guardians be our, like our dark knights right and then right. Our, our heroes and you know in this case they they fall and they and they and they willingly fall um right. so i think that's why it hurts so much um but i wanted to get into you know the circumstances around George Floyd and, and we, we can never know what was going through this guy's head, but um, I think we're quick and I, I'm not saying it's, it wasn't racism wasn't a factor, but I think we're quick to point out racism when if we're misdiagnosing the, the, the disease, then we're, we're not going to get it right either. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm open to the, the possibility that police in general are just undertrained and overly 
brutal at times. So I'm just curious to your guys' thoughts on on whole, like, is it racism? Is it police brutality? Is it a combination of both? What need, what needs to be fixed? And probably all of it needs to be fixed, but I'm curious to what you guys have to say about that. That's a loaded, loaded, loaded question. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is, but you know what? It's something that we need to talk about, right? Like, the, the problem is we, we don't talk about these things. We throw it out on social media. We go, blue, blue lives matter, black lives matter. But do we even know that this was a racial thing? Like, do we even know that this was, you know, a, or is it possible that this guy gets, you know, placed in a bad neighborhood, is dealing with violence every day? And just is like trigger happy and just goes, you know what? Like I've seen a lot of crazy shit and I'm just now I'm conditioned to just assume the worst in people. And I bring up the race thing because I liked having Justin on as you know, and I'm, I'm part Asian, but two of the cops there were, were half were Asian. Mm-hmm. So these, this wasn't like the narrative of four white guys doing this. Right. And I, and I don't think being racist is exclusive to being white either. R- racism isn't mm-hmm. a, isn't something you're born with. You'll actually so, find, to that point, you'll actually find that a lot of Asians are highly xenophobic and in turn become like very racist, a lot more oh, yeah. quiet than like the average population, right? The white population, but it's there. Like I have family members that say things and I'm just, I don't know how to respond. Mm-hmm. Um, like my grandmother didn't like me watching Michael Jackson because he was black and she thought that he might be gay. That's a real that's a real sentiment as, and she's an actual immigrant from here, but that was something every time that he was on TV that she would bring up. And, um, right. now, now that's just to that point. Now, when it comes to your original question about police brutality, the racism, uh, the systemic injustice that's there, um, and how can that be remedied? I think pr- police brutality can be addressed as yes. They see things far, uh, far more than the average person. And uh, I'm not defending police by any means, like in, in any of the actions and injustices that they have. Uh, but yes, they, they, they factually, they see more of that because that's their job to see more of that. That said, I think they're highly undertrained. I think one of the craziest stats that I saw was that a barber goes through like a hundred times more hours in training than a police officer does. Um, these people that see these things, that affects you mentally. And I think psychologically, a lot of them, especially if you've been in the force for God knows how long, like don't see therapy regularly. If anything, that's like something that they don't want to do. They just want to get through. When I think that's something that needs to be a part of, uh, of the process. Like they need to be regularly talking to people about how they feel about things, regardless if their weeks are boring and they're behind a desk. It's just things that they see and they come across their desk. It's like watching SVU your entire life and believing that every single person you come across is a potential rapist, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yes, there can be, but like, What's the majority of that? Like they're just not educated, which kind of brings me to one of the things that we can touch on later. I believe that ed- the education system is broken in more ways than what's actually taught, but in the the funding that's given to certain schools that are based on property. I think that there is that wealth gap um, is one uh, result of that. But like, I think it comes down to education and understanding that we need to standardize and level out the amount of money and funding that goes to all schools so that everyone has an equal chance. And again, education in the police force, letting them know what they're going to, um, letting them know what they're going to encounter and helping them address what they feel internally about the things that they see, the things that they experience, because that, uh, speaking to those Asians that were there and watching that, there probably was some of those sentiments that you brought up, Tony. Um, but then on Instagram today and anywhere on social media, they'll just call you. Get they, they, they would identify what you you're the way you ask your question is gaslighting, right? But at the same time, like you're asking a deeper question on like how can we address that? Like this is still a valid thought, and granted, out of context, that can that can be considered gaslighting and saying like, oh well, what what did this policeman go through? At the end of the day, a black man died, and he's not the first. Um, so how can we address that? And I think education. Um, to those people, for those people, the police officers will definitely be one way to start uh, changing their perspective on the people that, on how they approach certain types of people, specifically the black community. Wow, that was sad. <laughs> yeah, T- TJ, let me let me let me kind of piggyback on that and then all get right, your opinion. Right, um, you know, as, as you're the only black guy amongst the three of us, <laughs> um, what are you? You know, what are your what is what is your emotions towards police? And then, so 
throw in the emotion and then also th- think like logically what are what are your thoughts as well what, what's the first thing you think of and then when you are able to sit down and decompress what what comes to your mind then so the first thing i think about when i when i think of police i think of i think of a couple of things but let, let, how about I, i'll tell you what let me take you through what i feel when i see a cop car drive behind me Let's let's let's, yeah. let's start there. Let's start there. Well, let me, let me say this. Uh-huh. I've never felt any type of way. I bet the you have. I bet yeah, you have. And, and I guess that is like yep. I hate the word privilege, but I guess that's just the like it's just the way it's been for me. Yep. I've never ever felt threatened by a police officer, and I've never had a bad and you know what? Tony, history. Tony, I know this school. is your show. Yeah, but this is why you're on the show for the privilege perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna throw exactly. a little bit of lightness in there, <laughs> and then um, CJ continued. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, I got it, I got it. Um, but the truth is, Tony, your your reaction is right. Uh, anything from textbooks to PBS specials to Schoolhouse Rock, what have you, believe that you know when you see a police officer, you see hope, you see salvation, you see a hero, you see somebody who's going to fight your who fight the fights for you. That's what you're that's what you're taught and textbooks will have you believe the same thing that you know the police are the good guys and that the good guys wear blue and good guys wear badges and you know they 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 are the ones that you run to when you have a problem. You don't run away from them. So mm-hmm. you know you have that you have that idea, right? And then you fast forward uh, I I fast forward, you know, fifteen years and now I'm old enough to drive and old enough to kind of see the grays of the world, right. Or the thing is not as black and white as people make it out to be, you know? So you start to, you start to get old enough to start to see the grays and, you know, now you get a little bit older. And for me, when I see a police officer pull up behind me, there is an initial, there's an initial adrenaline rush, right. And there's an initial rush. Okay. You start going through this checklist. My seatbelt's on my, my phone is not in my hand. Um, my mirrors are adjusted. My insurance is up to date. My registration is up to like, I go through this mental checklist every time. Um, because I, I just immediately think if, if, if there's a cop behind me, he's going to stop me. Now I drive a, 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 a car that is, you wouldn't think a, a black guy would drive. I drive like a little Volkswagen, a uh, Volkswagen CC. So it's not like a, great car it's it's not a great car no it's not not a great (laughs) car at all but it's not a it's not a car that screams attention let's put it that way it doesn't scream attention it's not flashy it's it's very docile just you know very sedan it's 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 a decent sedan but it's very sedan nothing about that is screaming uh attention 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 right um but I, I can't pretend like that anxiety doesn't build up when there's a cop behind me. I can't pretend like anytime I've been stopped, I haven't turned on my Facebook live. So that way somebody has a, a, a mm. an account of what happened to me. I can't pretend that mm. I haven't video called somebody just to let them know that I've been stopped. And, you know, if something, if you don't hear from me, you know, start looking, you know, things of that nature. And, those are not what we're taught to feel when we deal with police officers. We're not taught to feel that we're not, you know, in the textbooks, again, when they explain things that have happened that you, they don't tell you to, to fear the police. But when did you start? When did that feeling come though? When did that, when did that start to happen for you? Has there been an encounter with police or was it, you know, media? Like, have you seen something on the media and then you were like, Oh, like this is, or you talked to friends. Like when did it happen for you? I think for me, it, it, it got real with Eric Garner. Um, I think not, I, actually, I take that back. I think it got real for me with Travion Martin, um, seeing mm-hmm. that there was no justice in that. Um, mm-hmm. That's when it became particularly real because truth be told, um, I'm about six feet tall. I'm a uh, uh, relatively well built. Like I, I would stand out to a police officer and mm-hmm. I have yet to have one bad encounter with the police officer. So I can't speak as if I've had an encounter with one that's, that's caused me to feel this way. I, I'm just, just being honest with you. I've never had a bad experience with a police officer. In fact, I've mm-hmm. probably been let off of more tickets than I've ever received. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just, that's just truthfully speaking. Now I also grew up in a household where I, I, I learned how to speak to people. I, I don't um, disrespect. Uh, I, I show 
I showed the, the the amount of respect that your position warrants. You know, you're a police officer. You're no better than me from the standpoint of you're a man. I'm a man. I put my pants on the same way you put your pants on. But your job, um, your job allows you or, or your your job puts you in a position to where your life is more on the line than mine. So for that, you have my respect. Like, I respect your position. I respect who you are and what you do. I'm um, saying that to say I, I still speak to them. Um, in the same manner that they would speak to me, uh, I give them respect. And, you know, like I said, I, I've been let off with more tickets than I've actually received. So I can't speak from a personal experience as far as having anything negative in regards to the police. But I can say that that anxiety is real. Um, hmm. And is it media driven? Maybe. Is it um, propaganda driven? Maybe. However... You know, we can look at people that might lie. We can look at people who may bend the truth. We can look at people who may spin stories to uh, to ascertain a certain uh, agenda. It's true. But what we can't dispute are numbers. Yeah. We can't dispute statistics. We can't dispute the fact that you have public records of these things happening. And we can't dispute the fact that we have public records of the fact that there is no repercussion for these things happening. Um, yeah. You know, this that that stuff is not debatable. Like this is in black and white. You can go and look this up. So while, yes, you can spin a story any kind of way you want to spin it. Yes, you can say that Fox News is blah, 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 whatever the case may be. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that the numbers will show you that we're killed off at a alarmingly higher rate. Yeah, um, it's a very disproportionate it's, it's very rate of black people that get killed. Um, so we're 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 killed in a, in a much much higher rate than any other race. Um, Not only that, you're more likely, I believe, to get pulled, pulled over, over yep. get jail time, yep. get jail time for petty crimes. Yep. Yeah, um, black uh, prisons are filled with yeah. disproportionately. Filled, black people only make up like thirteen yeah. percent of America, and prisons are I, I don't know the number but it's much much, it's higher. much higher than that yeah, yeah. And, and that's that yeah. and that's again we don't even make up the most of the population but yet no. our percentage of people are in there are much higher than anybody else's so point is the numbers just don't lie and yeah. when you take all that into consideration it does make me wary of police officers um again i, I have the utmost respect for uh the good police officers that we have but i think chris rock really said it best is you there's some jobs you just can't have bad apples in you, know, yeah. you can't you can't have bad apples in the police force. If you had a bad apple as far as a pilot, I think he, he said something about it. If you had bad apples and, you know, you had a pilot who, you know, 97% of the time he's going to land the plane, but there's 3% of the time he may not get it right. He's not going to be a pilot. Like right. if, he, if he, if he, if he, <laughs> if, if the plane doesn't land and he crashes the plane, you're not going to be a pilot still. So there are some jobs you just can't have a bad apple in. I don't want a doctor operating on me who has a drinking problem. Yep. Like there are some jobs you can't have a bad apple in. So you know, why do you know we not take funny? that same stance and approach when it comes to dealing with the people who we give badges to, who we give arms to, who we give the authority to make split second decisions on somebody living or somebody dying? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's interesting. Rogan brought up brought brought this up. He goes something along the lines of there there's not very many people. And this is based off no say. This is just him talking. But there's a, there's not very many people that can handle the amount of power you have when you are a police officer and you have a gun in your hand. And unfortunately, as Justin mentioned you know, with the training and all that, there's just we need bodies, right? So there's it's, it takes a very special mindset to be a cop and be in a position of authority and be able to handle the stress and all that's that goes on with that. And then when you put unqualified people in that role, it can lead to things that we're, that we're seeing right now. Um, but Justin, I was, I wanted to just get your thought. Have you ever felt anything towards cops? Like what do, what are your, what are your thoughts as a, as a minority? Bro, I'm Asian. I'm a, I'm a five foot seven Asian man. I look like the most disarming person in the world. <laughs> and it also doesn't help that I am disarming, but, um, something that, that TJ brought up was like, I was raised right. My mom didn't. Um, and th- this is somewhat related, right? I'm not going to say that I had like, it's anywhere on the level of like the experience of a black person in, in the States. But coming here, my mom didn't teach me um, Filipino. She didn't teach me Tagalog. Um, she didn't, she wanted me to be as American as possible. That's actually something built in ingrained into the Filipino culture. Um, and so I know how to speak to those things. And so sometimes 
my issue is the fact that I was raised right. And so I believe everyone else was raised right. I believe everyone else has like that mentality. And so do I ever feel like I can't talk to a police officer? No, I'm actually the guy that after, um, like even during this, like um, during during this protest, uh, during the shootings that happened uh, with Trayvon Martin and all those things, I'm the guy that goes up to the police officers that look like they are maintaining peace and security and doing that. And I go and I say thank you for – I walk up to them on the street and I say thank you for uh, serving us. Thank you for doing that. And so I have no fear of that whatsoever. Now when it comes to uh, being profiled for other things that don't lead to violence – yeah, I'm always profiled for being great at math and doing all those things. And so like, but again, these are things that don't lead to violence. And so I don't feel like I have that experience or like feel any anxiety. I feel the anxiety of like probably like every white person at that at that point in privilege. I'm like, oh, I just don't want to get pulled over. Um, I don't want to score my record and then my mom to find out. And I'm 33 years old. Like, that's my fear. Those are my fears. I'm not <laughs> fear. I, I'm not fearing going into jail or anything like that. But I also do understand that uh, because I am Asian, um, it, it, and like I'll touch on this, and we don't have to stay here. Like uh, it's like that model minority. So we're like on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is really weird. So a lot is expected of us to do certain things. Like if if you haven't seen, like Asians are put on blast right now, like more almost as much as the white people are for like their actual mm -hmm. racism it's like it's our job to stand up for you know the black community if you're not saying something like we're getting the grunt of it if you're not actively uh, posting about this and saying something and, and standing with them like there's an issue with you so there's this pressure um and they're and they're trying to avoid the whole model minority thing they're saying it's not because you're a model minority it's because they stood with us like it's our job to do these things and so it's like a really interesting dynamic um kind of where i believe that like the asian community and myself i feel at um, where i find myself over posting um, or feeling guilty for not posting um, hmm. or, or, know, or not supporting i i sent you a video and i think i sent it to tj too um but it was basically along the lines of this like guilt shaming for for not saying anything and i, I just want to kind of echo the thoughts that i saw in that video and i agree in that um I don't think, I don't think shaming anyone into posting anything helps. Um, I, I don't think, I think us listening and figuring out our best way to do it. But if we don't actually believe, you know, in what we're posting, then there's really no point. And I, I don't like the idea. I've seen, I've had white friends tell me, and they're like, I had a white friend this past weekend message me, um, or we got into a dialogue, and she just basically said. I posted something online where I just posted a picture of me and my husband in my IG story. And I had people yelling at me, how could you post something like this when there's a time like this in a, in a time like this? And then I posted something to, you know, show that I cared. And then I had my friends telling me, now you're sucking up. So it's like, I, I don't really, I feel like this, a lot of people are using this opportunity to, to shame people into doing things, but you know, I want to ask TJ, like, do you have expectations of other people? What What are your expectations, if any, of Ooh. fellow minorities, fellow people coming out of a situation like this with all that's going on? I think my expectations for, for people are simply just be a, a human being. Um, listen, I don't expect every person. Everybody's not built for what is happening. Everybody's not built for the debates and the the back and forth and the you know everybody's just not made for that some people just can't handle it and 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 that's fine i think where i think where i get frustrated for lack of a better term um is when you have people who are visibly upset about things like the looting things like the rioting mm -hmm. which again none of these are excusable i don't i, I don't condone Writing, especially that causes harm to anybody's livelihood, um, anybody's uh, home, things of that nature. I, that that's not okay, and that's not who we strive to be. Um, but here's 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 where it gets a little dicey for me. Is that if you're very very quick to vocalize how it's not okay to write, it's not okay to loot, but you're very very quiet in regards to 
the the things that happened to the African American community from the standpoint of you know the unjust uh, killings. That says something to me. You're more mm-hmm. worried about the response as opposed to the inciting incident. If you would spend the amount of frustration that you have for their response and you poured that frustration, you poured that energy into being as vocally um, frustrated or as vocally upset about the inciting incident, if people all kind of take that same mentality, then then we might get somewhere. But people are just so quick to want to look at their response and say, well, that's just not the way to respond. Well, we've we've tried peacefully protesting. We've tried taking a knee and not even looking for the attention. We've tried to hold rallies. We've tried to uh, march on DC. We've tried to do a number of things that have not worked. Mm. So tell us how you would like us to protest. You know, you tell us to protest peacefully. So we protest peacefully. We quietly take a knee. We, we march, uh, we march to DC. We, uh, demand to speak to our, our Congress and we demand to speak to the people that be as far as who are making the decisions for our communities. And we do all these things and it's still not enough. It's still nothing happens. I mean, we, st- we still have deaths, right? So then right. we take it a step further and now, oh, you guys are doing too much and now you're rioting and now you're, you're not peacefully protesting anymore and we're still wrong. So I think that we just look for consistency. I think that if I had to say anything else, I look for consistency. If you're very vocal about the fact that you don't like the looting and the rioting and things of that nature, I'm fine with that because I don't like it either. However, you better believe that I am just as quick, if not more so, to talk about the inciting incident versus just the response. It's not fair. You don't get to right. have it's treat, treating the, 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 the disease instead of just the symptoms. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Treat the disease. Don't just worry about the symptoms because, you know, if I have a cold, I can go treat the symptoms by just taking something to, you know, help me stop sneezing, help me, you know, stop coughing. But I'm not dealing right. with whatever's happening. Deal with the root. Don't just look at the, the outcome of the after effects. Deal with what's causing it first. And then yeah. we can progress to that other stuff. No, none of that stuff is right. It doesn't make it okay. But let's not pretend like we haven't tried to do things the right way before. Yeah, you um, know, I mean, go ahead, Justin. Um, I, I have a perspective on that because I completely agree with you, TJ, wholeheartedly, 110% um, on that. Um, but one of the big asks that I have in, in uh, socially um, supporting um, the cause is absolutely. let's find a way. Um, like Killer Mike just went on and he said he didn't yep. want to be on, but I thought he said it most beautifully where he was just like, yes. Let us not forget the cause. Let us let us proactively fight it and let us unite yes. together. But let's yes. do it responsibly. Let's mobilize yes. and organize. And my yes. big hope um, and, and one of the big solutions in, in making sure that the it's the right voice that gets out there is like we need leaders to rise up and step up and say, OK, I'm going to be a voice for the people. It's like elected by the people. What I'm saying, not not politically, but I mean within this movement so right. that we can say, here's here's what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Right. Right. And, and, and not just have like these siloed instances of people doing the right thing, but having someone say, this is the right way to do it. This is going to be our approach. Thank you for being with us. Just make sure we all abide by this, right? That also means acting against the looters. And when you see it firsthand yep. to make yep. sure that, the, that you don't uh, 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 take away from the actual cause. Right. Um, and I think that is yeah. super important. Um, I it think is. we just definitely need leaders to step up and to say like, hey, you know what? Let me be the one that's going to both speak for us and also take the grunt of the responsibility um, of, of the actions of those that are involved or are even instigating these things in, in, in for these people just to make sure, again, that it's not diluting the message. Absolutely. And I, I think that in that same breath, we, we want to have these leaders rise up. But I, th- I think where it gets difficult is we've seen it. We've seen it happen where leaders have risen up again. You look at it, and I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but you look at someone like a Colin Kaepernick who made an active stance and clearly had a lot to lose. I mean, granted, we can all talk about his football acumen and his football IQ and how good of a quarterback he was or wasn't. That's he also fine. might. We can argue about it, like his him being the conduit for the message, but yeah, yeah I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, we can argue. We can argue all the above, but what we can argue the fact that he's probably one of the biggest names who has made the most noise by doing the smallest thing 
and we've seen where his life has gone. Now, granted, he has, uh, he clearly has a life after football. He clearly has a life. And I hear my son in the background. I apologize for I that. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's fiery. He's fired up. <laughs> he, he's fired up about this one. <laughs> he's fired up about <laughs> it. But you can understand that, you know, we've had leaders and we've seen what happened to those leaders. You look at the Malcolm X's, you look at the Martin Luther King's, you look at the Colin Kaepernick's who have all been martyrs in, in different ways for the movement. Who've all mm. had something taken away from them, be it their life, be it their career, their life, whatever, what have you. They've been martyrs and they've had it taken away and we've gotten nowhere. So, yes, we do need leadership. We do need leaders to step up and be able to say, this is the way we're going to do it. This is how we're going to mobilize. This is how we're going to do that. Make sure it gets done. The message gets sent the right way. We're saying the right things, not the wrong things. We're doing the right actions, not the wrong actions. That's great. However, it becomes very difficult to find mm. those leaders when you consistently look at our history as far as saying, yes, we've had leaders to step up, but where are they now? Right. Dead. You know, uh, you know, you know, livelihood uh, gone, uh, things that I need, it just, it gets difficult. I, I do want to talk about leadership in a little bit, but I just had a thought that I wanted to get off my chest about the, the riots and all that stuff. Cause to be truth be told, the riots and the protesting, I wouldn't say it got me more mad than the than the incident, but it it made me to pay attention even more and it made me even more sad. And I've never seen in my life anything like this where people were destroying things and not only protesting, but just destroying things all over like big city, right. small city. Right. You know, and there was a lot of peaceful stuff too. I would say there absolutely most of the stuff was peaceful. So it's just the the small bunch. Now there's the thought, and I completely agree with it, in that you can only get picked on for so long before you punch back, yep. right? Yep. And I, and I I understand that sentiment completely. The only thing is is like it's I don't want to paint these things with broad strokes. There's a lot more nuance to all of this. So, yes, there's a lot of people that are pissed off and have been are mad about this and they're tired of of they're saying, you know, I I protested peacefully. Eh? How do you want me to do this? Maybe this will get your attention. Yep. The issue is is like that message doesn't always isn't fully click with me because i know there's a lot of people that are that are rioting and looting because they look at this as a way to take advantage of the situation or they maybe these are antifa people or white supremacist people or like it's just socially acceptable to walk around with a mask right now so you're much more likely to do something and get away with it so it, i just don't like the the broad strokes like of yes i understand the message of we, we need to get attention, but I don't think all these rioters and looters are looking for that attention. They're just looking to fucking destroy or grab free things <laughs> or incite things. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. it, that's uh, the thing that makes me well, mad too. Well, about Tony, this. you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a comic nerd and I'm, I'm a fan <laughs> of the dark Knight, Right. And you remember that <laughs> oh scene, my gosh. you TJ, remember that scene we, where Alfred <laughs> looks at Bruce and says, yeah, we just, we just became <laughs> best friends, Justin, but, uh, Alfred looks and Bruce and says, some people just want to watch the world burn. You have people yeah. who are just genuinely bad people. Um, and yeah. there's just no, there's no getting around it. And some people are just looking for an excuse to buck the system and to be an anarchist and to light a match that would, would start a, a flame that just engulfs the entire, some people just want that. And there's no, there's no getting around that. And, and that's why it's so important that, we rally and that we organize and we get the message out the right way. And again, this is, this is why I started off by saying, understand that rioting and looting is not right. Nothing about that is right, but we've tried to peacefully process in other ways. So tell us what more to do, but right. giving the, but rioting and looting is just giving people who want to see anarchy a chance to let that happen. Some people just truly want to see the world burn and that's what it is. Justin, I'll get to you real quick. I just have one quick follow up. What makes me really, upset about the rioting and looting is the the innocent people that get affected the businesses the random people that get beat up the cops that didn't do anything wrong get bricks thrown at them right and i right. i really wonder like what's the outcome of that do they look at this situation and go back to it and go instead of like looking at george floyd and being like we need to change maybe they look they associate the george floyd incident incident with something terrible that's happened in their life and now they're against the movement right like now you've created more enemies by the rioting or looting. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it, 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 it's, there's no easy answer. There's no cookie cutter response. There's no, this is the right way you're dealing with people. 
And when you deal with people, you deal with emotions, you deal with different psychological things, you deal with different physiological things. You just you're dealing with factors that you cannot control. These are variables in an equation that you cannot control. Right. So anytime you're dealing with that, the outcome is not really predictable. So granted, yes, this is why it's so important as a as a as a Christian that I I I, I be who I say I am. Right. Because. I have to, you know, they, they, there's scripture that says you want to be all things to all people so that way they can see Christ through you. Um, so I don't ever want to put somebody in a position to struggle. I don't ever want to put somebody in a position to feel some type of way, uh, about being a Christian. So I have to, I carry myself in a certain manner, right? So even when I go to deliver something that could be perceived as not particularly good, it comes from a place of love. Now, the problem is that everybody doesn't receive everything the same way. You know, so for instance, as a, as an athlete, right, you can get on me about something and I'll respond accordingly. I don't have a problem with you riding me a little bit. Everybody doesn't respond to being ridden that same way. So I can respond to this protest by taking a knee. I can respond or not the protest. I'm sorry. I can respond to this death by taking a knee. Everybody's not going to receive that. You know what that, what is that really going to do to somebody else? Right? So if at this point I say, okay, well, I don't have anything more. I've sent letters to my congressman. I've sent letters to the lawmakers and so on and so forth on Capitol Hill. And I've gotten no response. What more are we as a people supposed to do? Um, so it, 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 it's tough because again, you're, you're just dealing with people. That's just, it's, it's just so important to understand that I, I, you just have to focus on the message, focus on the why don't focus on the result, focus on the why, why, why do we get to this point? And let's start there, right? The, the, the truth of the matter is buildings can be replaced. Things can be replaced for the most part. And I understand that there are some times where, you know, you, you can't afford to rebuild. And I, I get that. I'm not making an excuse for that. But what I am saying is that materialistic things can be replaced. But when you start taking lives, you can't get that back. Once a life is taken, it's gone. There's no putting life back into that. So when people are upset about the rioting, the looting, yes, be upset about that because that's not okay. But make sure you're more upset about the fact that somebody lost their life and there's no amount of money that you can put out that's going to give them that life back. Justin, did you have something you wanted to interject there? Um, yeah, but there's a lot that happened in between. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so, you can take it back. Back to the Dark Knight uh, reference. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> let's talk about comics. Yeah, let's talk about co- comics. Like maybe <laughs> metaphors like will work. Um, yeah. Like one of the, like the reason that that trilogy resonates with me so much is because um, Dark Knight Rises. When I drove into the city, like that was the first image that yep. I had. Yeah. Was like seeing the bridges up. It felt Tanks. like I yep. was. Yeah, it was insane. Like it was. It, mm. That's what it felt like. It felt like complete anarchy. And chaos. Um, another thing, just to bring it right back, is like one of my favorite quotes of life from that trilogy, uh, specifically Dark Knight, is uh, the 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 dawn is dark, uh, the night is darkest before the dawn, um, yep. and that's what we're in right now. And I don't know how long it's going to last, but sometimes these kinds of things are. And again, I do not promote rioting and looting. Exactly. But all eyes are on us, and they're seeing us. And yes, this stuff is going to happen because times like this, a protest like this alone will bring that out. You add COVID and people having cabin fever and not being out and that mm-hmm. summer in Chicago Great and point. Like in mm-hmm. cities like this is that was bound to happen and it's going to yep. happen. And so we have to yep. accept that as part of this reality. And again, to TJ's point, we can't control all those other variables, except that it's going to be part of, of, of our situation. Yep. Um, and again, to TJ's point, like let's through this ask why and i think that's the biggest thing and again kind of just like the issue of uh of of where our nation's at and its ignorance the ignorance comes from a lack of desire or a choice not to see not to have perspective ignorance Mm. literally comes from like the active choice not to have perspective and i think that if everyone chooses to shift their perspective not to agree with the other side 
But just exactly. to shift it and see what's on that, shift what's it. On that yes. side, to shift it. Like just shift your place. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to stay there. But go there and see what kind of mindset they're going to be. If you can get to where a police officer is and why a good police officer might act irresponsibly in a moment, then get there on the black community side. Like see what they're feeling. Why might someone consider rioting? And I think in that you're going to get research knowledge and then you're going to get a personal um, like emotional connection to it because you're trying to have empathy for another side, regardless if you agree with the result. And um, just like I said, when Trump was elected, when everyone in the nation was down, I said, you know what? This is something our nation needs yep. um, because what was brought out of that, you realize how much racism, like bigotry and, and white supremacy actually existed in our country. We all thought that that was God. But that put a spotlight on all of it. And now people are coming out and you're realizing, oh, my gosh, it, this is far more widespread than I ever expected. Like no one knew that 51 percent of the country agreed with Trump. Like it's it's kind of wild that you still have 42 percent of the like he's like at, I think he's like at like low 40s. But like that's saying something. And that's that's a perspective that we on the other side of things, the knowledgeable people, like whatever you want to say uh, we are like now that we see that, like it, that's one positive thing that I see out of it. And um, I think that all of the things that are happening in the world, uh, again, is going to allow us the time to refocus on why it's happening. And yep. I think that's a very important thing because I do believe that like the world does have to go through some shitty ass things in order for it to come out of it well. Back to a terrible movie with Keanu Reeves, The Day the Earth Stood Still. I think yep. that's him. I mean, he was an alien that came to Earth <laughs> yep. and you find out that the reason he came here and, and saved like a, a little bit. It's like Noah's Ark, right? Because yep. the Earth was killing yep. itself. And uh, Alfred, he's back in there. Like his thing was like, maybe the Earth is on the precipice of change. And we have been given a century to change it. You've been watching us. But we, I think we're there. Can you just give us a chance to correct ourselves before you destroy us? Right. And, um, and I think that that destruction is, sometimes is necessary in order for us to rebuild. So that we're not rebuilding on the past. We're rebuilding anew. And that's where our movement is. No, oh, wow. Um, you know, since we're doing movie references here, uh, if you were to look uh -oh. at the, well, just, just roll with me. If you look at a movie <laughs> like, uh, uh, like Crash, you ever seen the movie Crash? Yeah. You look at that person. Broke, broke back mountain should have won that. Uh, oh my God. Just throwing that out there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Crash so is, uh, rewatchable for me. That's a rewatchable for me. It, it, it is rewatchable for me. It, it was a fantastic movie, but, you know, to your point that you were mentioning earlier, to see the way a police officer who and essentially could be a good police officer, you look at Ryan Phillips' character, right? He was a good police officer. He was a good guy. He understood that his partner was a bigot, was a racist, and asked to be removed, you know, for whatever the reason that he wanted to be, you know, whatever excuse that he used, flatulence, whatever. But he wanted to be put into a different car because he knew that that guy was a racist. He was a bigot. He was a jerk. He didn't want anything to do with them. He didn't want to be riding with them as his partner. Right. And then you knew that he was a, a halfway decent guy because then he goes and he helps Ludacris's character or not Ludacris. I'm sorry. Terrence Howard's character who had just mm -hmm. gone through the he just he just had a mental snap. He had a mental snap. He was literally held at gunpoint by about 20 different white cops who, uh, if we're being realistic, is now is not going to happen. But he was being at, held at gunpoint by 20 different cops um, and they did not shoot him because Ryan intervened. And then we get to the very, very last scene in the movie, or the second to last scene, one of the last ones, where his character helps an African American male who's hitchhiking, right? Trying to get him to some, you know, from point A to point mm. B and oh say, hey, God. we're going there together. We're going there together, right? So this is this good guy. This guy has been a hero, but we, he, well, we can't deny the fact that he's seen things. He's seen the seediness of the world. He's still trying to be a good guy out of it all, but he's seen seedy things. So he naturally still has these certain prejudices and these certain uh, ideologies of who African-Americans are in his head. So the character goes for what Ryan presumes is going to be a gun and he hauls off and shoots him just for the African-American characters to show that it was a statue uh, that was the exact same one that Ryan has in his car because he had this idea Ooh. that as a, as a black guy, he's going to shoot me because he's a gangbanger or whatever the case right. may be. That's why he's out here in the middle of the night, so on and so forth. So this guy who's been a hero throughout the entire movie, right? He's been helping throughout the entire film. Didn't want anything to do with the cop because he was a racist. And he turns around and kills an unarmed black man 
because he feared, right? There's no denying the fact that there's a human aspect to the job of being a police officer. There's no denying the fact that there are going to be times where we make decisions that are questionable. What we have to realize is we have to get better. We have to learn and we have to have systems put in place to where when we screen and when we do psych evaluations, much more to, again, to Justin's point earlier about having to have more training, more psychological training, more intensive understanding who they are and, and why they think and how they click. These guys have to be vetted. We have to know who yeah. we have behind the badges. We have to know who we're giving guns to. And saying, okay, it's just like a jury, right? In a jury, you ask a series of, you're asked a series of questions to weed out people who are going to have prejudices. And you go through a series. Now, granted, we're just talking about asking questions. So that's a bit of a rudimentary, uh, way of doing it, but it's still a vetting process, right? So it, it has to be much more in depth for people who we actively give guns to. I'm handing you a gun. I'm giving you the authority to use whatever force you feel is necessary to handle the situation. But your job yeah. is to protect and serve first. Yeah. Protect first. It's not serve and protect. It's protect and serve. Your job is first to protect and then you serve. Right? Your job is to de-escalate the situation and use whatever force is necessary. You know, you look back at the... uh uh, one of the shows I used to love growing up was uh, was Power Rangers, right? And they always made it very clear that the Power Rangers only went to the level that the bad guys went to. They only they didn't escalate the situation. They responded. They didn't escalate though. So I'm only going to go there if you make me go there, right? So we have to. I, I use Power Rangers as a, as kind of a funny example, but the truth is, they're trained to only escalate the fight if it needs to be escalated to help de-escalate and respond to the situation. That's how police officers are supposed to be trained. That's how they're supposed to handle things. They don't look at it that way. And uh, I shouldn't say they don't. Let me rephrase that. That's incorrect. You have some that don't look at it that way. You have some that will escalate the situation to have complete control over it and then um, do whatever they feel they need to do afterwards, uh, which is not necess- which is not the way it's supposed to be done. Um when you can have, <clears throat> excuse me, when you can have uh, shooters, uh, violent people who are not African American be arrested and detained and still be alive, who are shown to have yeah. killed people, who are shown to have bombed churches, who are shown to have shot up schools, and you can take them to get a sandwich, a meal before <laughs> you take them to jail, but yet a person who is unarmed, African American who's unarmed, who you've got a, a call out for a potential forged or a, a counterfeit $20 bill unarmed, but he's dead. The, 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 it, it doesn't add up, right? One person's response to it didn't, it, 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 again, the word that I'm looking at is consistency. Show me the consistency in that. No, yeah. it's not there. Actually, you know, sad, I think the sad part ahead, of the consistency that you did see with George Floyd was that there were four other officers that right. allowed it to happen. And that right. was the dangerous yeah. level of consistency. So clearly there, there is a systemic, there, there's an institutional issue. Exactly. With the way pol- police officers respond. Exactly. Well, I, I think I've read, you know, like I think the, the cure to a lot of this is accountability, right? Like I think if these police officer, if the, when this stuff has happened in the past, the, the problem is a lot of these police officers have gotten off. Right. Like we've seen charges come to these right. guys or we've seen charges to George Zimmerman. I don't think he was a police officer, no, but we've seen. Yeah. But, you know, we've seen these people get charged, but it's not enough because yeah. they don't actually get convicted of their crimes. And I, and I don't want to speak for police officers because I think there's by far the majority of police officers. Agreed. I think are good people. Agreed. Um, and I and I respect their job. Agreed. I personally could never do that job. So I don't want to speak for them, but I have seen some stuff online that have. It's basically like there's just kind of this code amongst police officers that you just don't rat each other. Exactly. Out. You, you just you just exactly. you, there's you if because if a police officer is caught lying about anything, it ruins his career. And no one wants to be that guy to, to ruin another man's career. Yeah, absolutely. So I think accountability is, is another big thing besides training. You know there's a lot of different things, but I think know, accountability is huge. You know, what's so interesting so about that statement is like if 
for us that were parented and that uh, would be parents and TJ, you are a parent. Like, you know what you call that person that doesn't hold you accountable? A bad friend, a friend that you mm. don't want to have. Like, how is that lost um, in, in a force that, again, is meant to protect and serve? And you, you just know, have yeah, a lot I, of people that are just like acting like they weren't raised. Right, right. And, you know, you even take that like that's that's even something that we have in Christianity, right? Iron sharpening iron. Right. As as a brother in Christ, if I see something that's happening as a brother in Christ, I should be able to come to you and say, hey, look, this is this is what I'm seeing. I'm not trying to come at you from a standpoint of frustration. This is out of love. This is out of me wanting to see you continue to make it in your walk. This is out of me wanting to see you hopefully one day in heaven. I should be able to point something out to you. And then that just be the end of it, as opposed to, uh, well, who do you think you are? Well, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm a brother in Christ. I want to just be able to point something out to you and explain to you how this is not right. And then if we can't sell it, then we go to our, our organization's leader to say, hey, this is what we're having this bump. Can we help get it resolved? Because we all want to move forward in love. Right. So with police officers, there's this code that's no different than the street code. If, if, if we're being frank, you know. Is no different than the no snitch code that people have in hoods, you know, that, that we have in the hoods and we don't tell on each other. We don't talk, we don't deal with the police, right? Cause we don't snitch mm-hmm. on each other because the police aren't going to snitch on themselves. There is, I can, I can, I can tell you with 100% confidence that that code is active. I have friends who are police officers who said, I, I absolutely, if it happens, I, I can't snitch. I, I can't snitch. But the problem is, when you have two bad cops and a hundred good cops who know that the two bad cops are there, all you have are 102 bad cops now because yep. you're allowing it to happen. Now, I understand that at the end of the day, you might have been a really great guy, loving family man, beautiful wife and kids, um, dog, picket fence, the whole American dream, right? White picket fence on the hill. All of that. But if you allow one of your peers to murder without any type of without any type of uh, holding them accountable for it, without any type of accountability, you're no better. And it, it's, it's a sad realization, but but it's it's true. You're you're no better. So accountability to Justin's point is, is huge. The question becomes, how do we hold them accountable? Right? Because we've tried the body cams. We have the body cams. Now we, we fought for body cams a lot and we finally have a lot of different law enforcement agencies who use body cams, but then the footage um, is not allowed to be seen by the public. And the footage is sometimes upsetting or the footage is sometimes lost or it's, you know, all the body cam fell off, whatever the case may be like, there are a million and one excuses as to why the body cam footage isn't working. You have police officers who don't feel like their actions should be recorded because, you know, now it's going to make me question every action I take because I'm going to have to be scrutinized. Well, isn't that, shouldn't that have been the, how you felt at the beginning? You should have always felt like every action you do has to have a, a explanation. You should have always felt that you were going to be scrutinized for everything that you've done. You're a police officer. You uphold justice but you're also there to protect and serve. So everything you do because of the job you're in is going to be scrutinized. So a body cam shouldn't enhance that for you. You should be fine if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's why they have these shows. Uh, one of these shows that I've been watching since I've been, since we've been quarantined essentially, um, and since I've been home with my wife uh, for bonding with our child is it's called 60 days in. And it's a show, I think it's on Annie. I don't know, we use slinks, I don't know. But it's a show that I think is on Annie. And essentially, you have undercover people who are thrown in jail, thrown in prison. And nobody in the prison knows that they're undercover. Except for the, the warden. And I think his one other person, but the other police officers, the other uh, correctional officers, and the, the other inmates, they don't know that you're not really, um, that you're, 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 you're a mole essentially. So that way they can see how you act in certain situations. They can see how the police officers or the correction officers, if you will, respond to certain situations mm-hmm. without the bias of, you know, having somebody else who's a police officer look at that and, and try to 
fib something up or try to doctor up something. You know, we have raw footage of it. Um, and that's why it's such a controversial show because it, it allows you to really see the nitty gritty. And there are some things that are, are really jacked up in our, uh, in our uh, correctional system. Um, but that's why those shows are interesting. And that's why the idea of a body cam really shouldn't be a bad thing. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, then a body cam is nothing more than really protection for you. Not for, not for anything else other than protecting you because you did what you were supposed to do the, the first time. So what are you worried about? Yeah, man. I mean, when I, one of the, the sites actually we were talking about how to, how to improve. Um, and one of the sites I found that I, I, I kind of vibed with and, and actually ended up donating to yesterday um, was joincampaignzero.org. And I'm not sure how you got familiar you guys are with this one, but the three of the things we had mentioned are, are three of the, there's 10 ways that they've come up with to um, improve police. And um, three of the things we mentioned actually are on there. Um, so it's just a good, you know, when we're talking about um, how we can help, because I think it's important to not only have the, I think these conversations are really important first off. Um, but I also think we need to figure out how we can help in our own ways. I, and as you mentioned, TJ, I don't think not everyone's built the same way. We're all human. So we're not going to react and do everything the same. And I, I don't think it's fair to expect the same out of everyone. Right. But um, I think it is important to provide options for people, right? Whether it be your use of social media, the conversations you have, protests, cleaning up after the looting, um, donations, all those kinds of things. I think that's also very important um, coming out of this is how how are we going to do this? Not only having the conversations, but then executing on our on the plans that make sense to each individual. Right. All right. Amen. Justin, um, you had mentioned leadership, and I, I wanted to get to that. Um, and I'll start with my thoughts, and I'll, I'll, I want to hear what you got what, what you got to say. I, I don't. Th- it's it's clear to me the president that we have has not helped things. Um, he has not shown, in my opinion, proper leadership at all, and especially during this time. Um, it, it, it kind of, it, it's interesting to me, if not a little painful, you know, some of the tweets he puts out. Um, I watch, I, I listen to some of his speeches, and to be honest with you, I listened to his speech when he went at the, the space launch, and I listened to parts of his speech um, at the church, and a lot of what he said actually is fine as far as he stood with the pro- peaceful protesters. He he wants justice for George Floyd. But if you look at his tweets, it's just not very, the, the rhetoric is awful as far as thanking himself, as far as the when the looting starts, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, all those things. And I find it so interesting that if he could just come out and have a speech that I think most presidents would do in his situation and address the nation and go, Say something along the lines of, uh, you know, this is terrible. We're going to announce these X, Y, Z reforms. I stand with the protesters. I'm against the looters. And if he just said, and I know he can't ever say it, but if he just said black lives matter, I think he would get elected. He, he would completely change. The, the whole country would, would start rallying for him. But he's just not that kind of guy. So, you know, you'd mentioned leaders, Justin. What is the effect of, and you can give your opinion on Trump, but what is your what is the effect of bad leadership or the leadership we currently have on all of this? When you say leadership, are you talking about like our like U.S. leadership or like for the movement? Well, I mean, I think I think it starts at the top, right? Like it, the the top in our in the U.S. would be the president, but also, yeah, I mean, it 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 falls upon state leaders, local leaders, community leaders. So, just kind of your thoughts on on the role of leadership and starting with with the top. Um. Well. Pff, mm-hmm. Okay, might get some hate for it. So I'm just going to speak. Uh, Trump never, his platform was never a social progressive one. It never was. That was never part of it. And so I don't fault him for not speaking about it because that's not his focus. Uh, for his speaking from like what he campaigned for, which was for the economy and, you know, for business and to boom the business. That was his focus on getting the best trade deals and all that. And so I don't expect him to speak on this, though I would love our act like, just in general, our president to say something on it, but I don't expect that from him. Um, Mm -hmm. But is is that something you've adjusted for Trump? Like, would you, would, uh, my question would be, would, is that because he's conditioned you to 
you, you just don't very you don't have those expectations. I, I just don't guy. have that expectation from him because that wasn't his platform. Gotcha. And uh, one of the beauties of why uh, Obama was able to spark so much change is because he had a very focused platform versus what we have in the primaries now. Unfocused, you have people that are like like adjusting their platforms to speak for the people versus having like you know your your you, mm-hmm. your folk like. Obama was just very focused on what he was going to do. Um, so was Trump, ar- arguably. Like, there is consistency in, like, his campaigning and what he does. I'm not speaking to, like, how he addresses and, like, that's, that it's right that he doesn't address it. But I'm just saying I don't expect that from Trump um, on that level. Uh, the one thing that I've always believed, though, is, like, yeah, local leadership um, uh, amidst all of this. Like, that's where all the change begins. Like, the states are given a lot of power to do those things. With your, now that uh, uh, one of the beauties of COVID and and all this protesting is you realize what your governor actually does and what your mayors of your, uh, of your municipalities actually do. And, um, unfortunately they have a really tough job right now, really tough job. They're dealing with COVID and now all the, the protesting. And then in addition to that, the looting, the rioting, there's a lot that they're, they're dealing with. And so the leadership that I'm speaking to is like the local community leaders, um, that, that ladder up, like to build that infrastructure. Like we need those in our communities and those people to step up. And to TJ's point, it is a difficult position to take, you know? Um, but because there are so many voices out there that are for the cause, like let's just take out all the, the rioting and the looting and all those things, but for the cause, just to have someone behind there. Like I go back to like the wall street protests, uh, the 99 uh, and the 1%, like their biggest issue was that they, they protested well enough to be heard, and then they did have someone there that, as they were heard, to line out like what they can do um, to be a part of the solution. And so that's just the big thing. It's just like, yeah, we. Uh, am I asking for another Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X? I, I think I am, I, and I think it's absolutely necessary. And maybe it doesn't have to be one person, but it can be uh, like a group, a board of multiple people uh, from around the nation uh, that can unify the voices. Um, that when, when and if, or if the government decides, the federal government decides to uh, have a conversation about this, there can be people that they can go to to have that conversation that were elected and risen up uh, by the people and are for the people. TJ, what are your thoughts on on leadership <laughs> and, and starting at the top? <laughs> uh, oh man. What are my thoughts on leadership? Well, <laughs> how much time you got? Starting with the guy in office, right? <laughs> Starting with the guy in <laughs> office. Um, you know, very much to Justin's point, there are certain expectations that I had for Trump. There are certain benchmarks that I had for Trump, and he's hit every benchmark that I've had. Everything that I've expected out of Donald Trump, <sighs> good or bad, good or bad, is what okay. we've gotten. So. I knew we would have somebody that was very, very much for the economy, very, very much for, as you mentioned, you know, make sure that we got the best trades, we got the best deals, we got the best everything because we're the best country in the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was not built for something like this. He was not built for COVID-19. He was not built for race riots. He was not built for uh, systemic racism. He, that's not That's not him. So his leadership has done exactly as what I thought his leadership was going to do. And that was still going to be focused on the things that he's strongest in. He's strongest in working for the economy. He's strongest about trying to keep dollars in people's pockets, even though he's, he's padding the lines of his billionaire, but he's more than the, than, you know, the, the blue collar workers, but that's another story for another day. Um, when we come to, again, to Justin's point, you know, we're looking at the, the municipal leaders. We're looking at the mayors and the governors and their jobs are extremely, it's almost like middle management, right? You know, you're getting the worst of it from the people, just like the middle management gets the worst of it from the customers. You know, you're getting it from your customers and you're getting it from upper management. So now you're the one in the middle trying to decipher and trying to figure everything out, right? No different than, you know, you have the president who makes his proclamations, get your cities and get your states in order before I send the army in to, to do your job for you, whatever the case may right. be, right? Making those very, very broad, but very, very point, I shouldn't say broad, very pointed statements, um, you know, kind of poking the bear, if you will, right? So you get it right, right. or I'm going to come in there and fix it for you, and it's something else I'm be able to hold over your head. So they, I don't envy their positions. I really don't. Do I want another Malcolm X? Do I want another Martin Luther King? Um, I don't know. I don't know, because 
there's nothing that people like to see more. And again, another quote from a, another great movie, you either die <laughs> the hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain, right? People love to make martyrs out of people. People love to watch bad guy or watch good guys fall. Like it seems to be something that as, as a people, we just en- enjoy watching. Not that it's a good thing, but we just can't help it, you know? Right. So, you know, you have these heroes, the Martins and the, the, the Malcolm X's who we, we, we use them up until they're expired. You know, you even look at somebody like a, like, a, like an entertainer, you know, look at somebody who not to the same effect, but look like a Michael Jackson. He's somebody that was such an entertainer. He tried to do too much and you just, you just use them up till you can't use them up anymore. They're, they're, they're expired. Right. So we we'll have these heroes and we'll try and we'll put them on this pedestal and we'll try to ride them and we'll try to encourage them and build them up. But then somebody's going to want to, take them out again. You know, you have some people that just want to watch the world burn. Um, I just don't know if it's fair to put that on any one person, you know, maybe the Justin's point, we have it be multiple people. Maybe we have a council, you know, that, that goes and speaks on our behalf, but then who decides who's on that council and how do we hold that council accountable? You know, the way our government system is set up, it's supposed to work. We're supposed to have, we have a system of check and balances for a reason. To not give complete authoritative power to the president, to not give one particular branch, judicial, executionary branch, any more power over the other. But it's just somewhere along the lines, we twisted it. Somewhere along the lines, we um, messed it up. And it's hard to want to put somebody else in that position to, to fix these type of things, because truth be told, I don't know if we're ready for that. I don't know if we have a good enough plan put in place to to fix things and uh, trying to find one person or trying to find somebody to represent us, uh, if you will, is is a task that's meaningful, but is also a task that is almost impossible because who's going to be that person to step up? How do we tell you that you are now putting your life in essentially in, not in forfeit, but your life, your life is on the line. You know, you're you're a, you're a target. You may not be prepared to be a target, but you're a target. Your family is a target. Anybody that's ever been close to you is a target. That's a lot to ask somebody. That's a lot to ask any person. I know personally as a father of two, um, as a husband, I don't know if I'd be comfortable putting myself in that position because now it's not just myself I'm looking after, but I'm looking after my family. You know, so I, yeah. I, I, it, it, it's... It's, the, it's really the, the crux of this entire movement, right? We want change, but what are we willing to do to get that change? What are we willing to give up? Who are we willing to sacrifice for that change? And I just don't have the answer to that. I just don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's tough. I think I, I just want to circle back to Trump real quick. I do agree like I don't completely disagree with everything he does and I and I do agree like the president needs to also uphold law and order. Um I think the issue with, for me with Trump is I don't not only the rhetoric but I think the just his overall either if, whether it be him or whether it be the media and we can get into the media mm. playing up this image that he is actively dividing people I think is really kind of contributed to this powder keg that has exploded currently um and it was bound to happen um with all the other ingredients but i i don't think he's necessarily helped but i also want to bring up the media in terms of like what is the media's role in all of this because you know ever since uh reagan repealed um i forget the act but um you know we we don't we don't have fair media anymore we have very opinionated media whether it be cnn fox like I see both sides. I see I see how one sided each station is. So, you know, what what is the media's role been in, in the, all of this and you know, they and they they love to f- focus on the, the the looters and all that stuff and they and they we never see I mean unless you follow you're on social media, you never see the good things, right? You hardly ever see the good things. So, just kind of want to get a temperature check on what do you think the media's role in in all of this and have they been positive, negative? What are your thoughts? Uh, I can say something uh, because it affected me personally. Um, I've always said, especially uh, especially since the advent of Trump uh, becoming our president, was like the media 
has an uphill battle. And one of the most important things for them to do is to start is report facts and the news as it is and to remain as unbiased as possible. Um, and I said that uh, years ago when Trump was elected. And I think that's important now because they are it's an alarmist media that we have out there. Everything's breaking news to the point where it's not breaking anymore. It's just news. Like, it's like, what, what are you saying? Like everything is like a, a, this huge story and they're blowing it out of proportion specifically to the protests and the riots. Um, the most phone calls I got was on Sunday and this was after Sunday evening. And this is two days after like, you know, two days into all the protests and the looting and all those things about people finding out about this. And the things that they're finding out about is um, like the terrible forms of this and in chicago and the south side that's when like you had whole malls being looted and and burned and it's just happening in the south side and everyone was worried my family and friends were worried about my well-being but that wasn't happening downtown they were just so focused for hours on this one location in this far like and on in the same way that in chicago like the the murders and, and all the shootings outside of COVID, outside of rioting that happen are in very very specific locations it's not all of chicago and again, it was just so alarming to see how much attention they gave to all of that when actually that was the beginning of the peaceful protesting. And there was a lot of good protest actually happening. And they were connecting those dots intentionally or unintentionally. And I mean, it's the media, so it's, oops, it's as intentional as it can possibly be. And that bothered the crap out of me. It, it, oops, sorry. Wow. I was like at a point. Did you, just drop a, did you just drop a bunch of marbles? Uh, kind of. Uh, my headphones and <laughs> something on my keypad and then started playing the rewatchables. That's nice. my head up for night. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I was speaking with my hands as I normally do. Um, but that's it really bothers me on what the media is covering and how much attention they're giving. In the same way that we're talking about the disproportions of, of like uh, of, of people in jails, like the, the, like they need to be appropriate with what they're what they're putting out there and they, they need to be responsible again which is something i called for responsibility in your reporting and not to focus it all on one thing that is only 10 percent of what's actually happening because what was missed out on sunday's reporting specifically was the fact that the city had or the protesters had figured out uh, a way to do it responsibly more responsibly and people were actually standing up, and that's when the cleaning crews uh, of protesters were coming out to to clean up the city. And all they could focus on was the looting and the rioting and all of like this bad energy. And, like it's just to me that is dangerous, um, and it almost backs uh, like Trump's statements about fake news about like what you're actually seeing out there is not the majority of what's actually happening. <clears throat> well. Yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, I completely agree with that statement because there were many, many instances, and obviously this was not stuff that was broadcasted, but there were many, many instances of the protesters protecting buildings. There were instances of protest uh, protesters standing in between a police officer who was separated from his unit and was just kind of caught out there, almost like a, remember that scene in The Lion King where Simba was caught underneath that tree at the stampede? Right. You know, that police officer was caught out there by himself. So there are protesters who were literally protecting him, trying to get him back to his unit. Right. But those are images that don't make the news. They don't make CNN. They don't make Fox because it doesn't tell the narrative. The truth is the media really does have the ability to sway public perception. Right. (sighs) Looters and rioters gather much more hits on news feeds on uh on viewership on uh, that's that's what that's what gets people clicking on things right is having that initial gut reaction to get somebody a gut reaction you have to have something on there that's gut reaction worthy a bunch of peaceful protesters who are doing it the right way is not it's not a gut reaction there's no gut reaction to that it's it's, it's boring to the media so the media of naturally is is still in the business of entertainment. They're going to do what they can to spin and uh, make people watch them, right? Uh, People aren't going to click on them to watch 
a guy watching birds, right? But they're going to click on him to watch a guy who's being harassed by a white person because he's black trying to watch birds and the person's dog is not leashed. And so, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, they're not going to cover the story that the black guy is just watching the birds. They're not going to, if there was no inciting incident, you'd never know if there was a black guy out there watching birds, right? But because there was this incident, oh, that's that's newsworthy. That's what we're going to follow. That's where we're going to go. So... Trump is absolutely very is actually accurately um, talking about the media being fake news. Because a lot of times they agree, are. Yeah. Uh, what's important for us as consumers and as the audience, we have to be smart about it. We have to look at multiple sources and not just go off of our favorite sport, our favorite anchor. Right? I don't want to just go off this one person and say, "Okay, well that that guy said it, so it's, it's absolute truth." The, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gamer and, uh, I play a game called Assassin's Creed. And in that game, you know, they say nothing is true. Everything is permitted. What true, what is truth? Truth is what you see it to be. Right. Um, but it's what you're permitting to come into your, your, your mind is what you perceive to be truth. So we really just have to be as a consumer more responsible from what we're allowing to come into our mind, what we're, what we're allowing to us to 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 believe is truth um just because this person on fox says it doesn't make it true now if you've got three four or five sources saying the same thing then there may be a little fire to that smoke but or smoke to that fire excuse me um but we have to be as a consumer we, we we've just got to be better about that we've got to be better about understanding that you know what we're seeing may not be the whole the whole picture and that's really what the the, the crux of this conversation is about is understanding that there's more to this than just what meets the eye. It's like a transformer. There's more to it than what meets the eye. Um, we can't, everything's not face value. There's much more underneath and we have to be willing to look and understand that uh, to really get anywhere, any kind of progress. The, the, uh, the rule, by the way, I just looked it up was the FCC fairness doctrine. It was um, where you had the news had to present, basically present, both sides of any views on of matters of public importance and uh, Reagan when Reagan's um, presidency, they got and they ended up getting rid of that, which is the advent of a, of a Fox news or a CNN, which are, you know, like it's, it's just so interesting to me. You see CNN cover Trump's um, speech at the church and I watched it on CNN and they were literally playing the, the images of people getting shot at by the, by the um, the National Guard or whatever, uh, with tear gas or um, rubber bullets, and it was just like you're playing both at the same time. You're clearly like this is an agenda. Yep. And then you look at like Fox or like some some conservative stuff, and they were comparing that to like the most courageous thing ever. I think uh, Trump's um, press secretary compared it to Winston Churchill in World War II. <laughs> so it's just like you definitely like the media is so biased towards either side of the of the argument that they are taking stands on everything everything is so binary and i think it really has um created seeds of distrust divide but also um this distrust of of media like you saw i think i i was i finally started to notice it when um coronavirus was hit when hit and the me the a lot of the conservative people were so um, distrusting of of media that they were like this is bullshit i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna there's there is no virus because they've just been conditioned and maybe rightly so that the media is fake so i think long-winded but i think the media has played a big role in terms of especially since that that act in 1987 was repealed the fcc fairness the fairness doctrine um the media has really influenced a lot of this divide and a lot of the playing up of these things that are um awful because not because they have altruistic intent on exposing things but more because it's just going to gather ratings um the media right now most simply reminds me of like the difference between streaming uh, music and radio music it's just like they play the same thing over and over because they're paid by the agents uh, of these musicians to play that music and that's what they're getting the country to, to listen to. And to TJ's point, I think the best way to remedy that is to make sure that you are a responsible consumer of it and actively, exactly. if you care about something and you want to, and you want to find out more, find out more, but not from the same place. 
It's yep. like yep. do a good book report. Like if you yep. turn in a book report <laughs> in grade school and you had one source on there, you it's an immediate fail. I don't care if it was the most eloquently, brilliantly written thing. If you had one source on there, it's not a good report. Exactly. Exactly. We just like you said, just be a responsible consumer of it and and do your own not not your own fact checking, but just understand that you have to put in some legwork, right? If you truly feel something about anything, then do your homework. Don't just have a knee jerk reaction to anything. Understand what it is, learn about it, and then respond accordingly. We just have we're so quick to want to respond. We're so quick to want to get our opinion out there that we do so without gathering all the facts. And that's the problem that I, that I particularly have with a lot of the media um, is everybody's just so quick to get a headline, right? Um, one of the most heinous things that has happened in 2020 from the standpoint of media, just irresponsibility is the fact that before Vanessa Bryant was informed that Kobe Bryant had died, mm. it was put on TMZ. Yeah. Right. That's the most disturbing, disgusting misuse of of media in that i can think of in recent memory because of the- we'll throw, also throw on that i think a reporter believe from nbc but it was a major network tweeted out that all the do- all the daughters were on the helicopter as well mistaken right so you do that and then it it, it just it, it it's in, it's infuriating right so there's a responsibility and I really feel like even, you know, like that doctrine that was that was signed or that was canceled or whatever that you had just referred to. Um yeah, the, the FCC, FCC fairness doctrine. Yeah. Um those are the kind of checks and balances that you really do need. Um because the truth is, you know, well, I shouldn't say you really do need it. We need it because we just like to consume media. But the truth is we being the consumer have to be more responsible. We being the consumer have to let them know that we we just can't keep accepting what you're going to put out there and just lapping it up like that's that's the absolute truth. Um, we just have to do better about ensuring that we're doing our own homework and that we're learning about things for ourselves and not just taking your word for it because your word is proven to be <sighs> mis miscued. Your word is proven to be um, not accurate. Your word is proven to be misleading. Um, we have to, we have to, we just have to be better about informing ourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead, Justin. Um, since you are like a TV show nerd, that's like what your main point is. Uh, there's a really great series to watch HBO. It's called Newsroom. Watch the first season. Aaron Sorkin wrote it. Uh, it, it talks specifically about this, about the, the they, they call it the red team and, uh, Every news story that comes through, there's a red team that is meaning to refute that actual story. And you come together and you basically have like a, a courtroom case for that story. And you figure out like, is it true with people actively trying to fight you? And that's good media. That's good news. Mm. Um, yep. And that's something that maybe like, I don't know, it rings true um, and more relevant than ever in today's uh, society with the advent of the Internet. You know, I, I think also I, I touched upon this a few times, but I think we can we can jump on it here. Is so, what do we do now, right? Like, how do we get better? And um, you know, because we can't keep having we can't keep having black men get killed by police officers. We can't have anyone get killed by police officers that that are um, not uh, resisting arrest or deserving of, of the, the extreme brutality. Um, but it seems to happen more to black men, black, uh, the black community. Um, we also can't have, if, if, if it was racism, we can't continue to just be okay with racism either. Um, but we also, in my opinion, we can't have the response be to destroy family businesses and take and beat up people and hurt innocent cops. So how do we, move forward what do we do and um i'll start by saying you know my i work for live nation i never i've never really brought up where i work because i don't i don't feel a need to but um, i work i work for live nation entertainment one of the biggest companies in the world and on tuesday of this week blackout tuesday which was um something that was actually started within the music industry and i felt like social media co-opted it to make it a black tile day um and that's a whole nother thing but they gave us the day off on tuesday and they basically said 
They gave us a bunch of resources and encouraged us to take the day as not a day off, but as a day to reflect, to think, to read up as much as you can, and then to actively participate in conversations or um, do what you can, whether it be protest peacefully, whether it be help clean up, whether it be donate, whether it be just have a conversation. Um, and I thought that was really good, but the message coming out of that was it, from our the leadership was this can't be the only day. Like we, we can't just take one day and, and think about it and then let it, let it go. Right. Cause that hasn't worked. The, the hashtags haven't worked. The peaceful protests in the past haven't worked. Um, and this is a long fight. So I, I'm wondering what you guys think as far as what do we do? What, what, what's necessary? Where, where do we go? What, what can we do to help this out? Um, and, and get better from this. Wow. That's, uh, that's a question, right? <laughs> I think, if, I think, I think, I think if, that's the big uh, question to come out of this, right? I think if anybody really had that answer, we wouldn't be talking about it on the podcast. We'd be, you know, in 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 a boardroom somewhere in the White House, maybe, or trying to be some type of de-escalating task force. I don't know, but <laughs> there might be something like that there. there. Could Who be, knows? There could um, be quite possible. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is going to sound so. Yeah pompous of me, but I think I have a beginning of a solution. Um, and I, I talked about it earlier is education. Um, yes. As, as a former educator, I, yeah. the one thing I saw was like just the disparity between I taught, uh, I student taught, let me correct myself. I student taught in a, in like the richer high school. And then I student taught in the, uh, in the lower income middle school. And you can see the entire difference there. And the fact, and this is something I did look up and, and the reason that like certain neighborhoods always have like great uh, student outcomes that become successful is because property taxes are divided by like even smaller than a city, like the neighborhoods that you live in. Um, I just, re- and I am a perpetuator of this in, in some form. I just purchased a house in the city in the only, because I only wanted one district because I knew it had the best education system. It's where a lot of wealthy people live and we had the opportunity to actually make a purchase there. But that was the deciding factor for us. Um, was the only way we live in the city is this place. And I, I think it's unfair. And then it puts, again, uh, I think it can address a lot of issues. I don't want to go too deep into it. But like if every school gets the same budget every single year, that evens the playing field for people to rise up out of their communities and become better. It gives them the, the, the perspective. It gives them the education. It gives them the same. It, no one's at a disadvantage. If all schools are getting paid the same amount of money, you're going to get even um, uh, teacher, the right teachers in the right places. And, and then back to the police brutality, like just I, like the proper education um, on, on how to approach this and how to uh, view uh, on what you, on how you might view other people on things that you deal with every single day. Um, back to uh, the bigots and the, and, and the racists of the world and the people that don't know what to do with themselves dealing with this protest ignorance is the issue and so if everyone made an active decision to educate themselves on what's going on 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 the perspectives of other people um like that could change a whole lot and we can start that today um and then again i'm an oversimplifier of some things and to gandhi's point like change begins with you and so for people to decide to be educated and knowledgeable people to decide to shift their perspective to see the other side um, I think those are really great places to start at. Uh, and, and honestly, that's, I, I do believe that that's where the change begins. You know, you know I, I have a quick comment on, on, on that, Justin. Um, and you had mentioned in education and, and getting rid of ignorance. I think a lot of what gets lost now, is, especially on, in, in this day, of a, day and age, is I listened to this podcast with Joe Rogan where he had, uh, I forget the, the, the African-American guy's name, but he had converted over like 200 um, white supremacists to give him back their robes, give him his, their robes. And the, the big message I got out of that is um, he was willing to have conversations with those people, right? And the problem is, is I think too often there, there's, there's going to be a lot of ignorant people that are probably racist, right? We're not that far from, we're only a, 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 a lifetime away from segregation and Jim Crow laws and, and all that stuff and people getting hosed in the streets. So it's, it's not that far away. Like it's, it really, we haven't, we haven't, that not that much time has passed, but I think 
the issue is, is I think we, we look at these people and we immediately go, well, you need to go into a black hole, right? We look at these people and we go, go away forever. Fuck you. Shut up. We're not going to listen to you. That, I don't think that actually helps at all either. By taking someone and just calling them stupid all the time doesn't make them all of a sudden go, you know what? I'm not racist anymore because a million people called me stupid. You know what? That actually emboldens them. So I think we as a society need to not only have these have conversations but seek out some of these people. And I know it's sometimes it's scary, but I think going out and having conversations with these people is important. And I think the reason why a lot of these people are racist or feel a certain type of way towards a different person is not because um, like they, they were born this way or anything, but I think they, there's fear, right? There's, there's definite fear. Uh, there's fear of the unknown and no one's ever approached them to tell them otherwise or to show them otherwise. So I think, I think it's, we have to be careful in terms of shunning away the people that have the mo- the worst views on others. I think it's important to open up dialogue or at least they have to be willing to listen first, but I think it's important to have be active in terms of having dialogue with these people and figuring out their perspective and how we can potentially help to change them. You know, Tony, speaking to your, uh, to your point before I answer that question, uh, this yeah. week has been very interesting for me in regards to social media because I've been more tempted than ever to delete people from my social media, hmm. right? I've been more tempted than ever to delete people from my Facebook, from my Twitter, um, just because I didn't like what I was seeing, but I did not do so for the sole reason that I didn't like what I was seeing. It's important that just because we don't agree with something that somebody says that we don't take away their ability or their right to have that opinion um, and that we don't become so en- engrossed in our own bubble, if you will, that we don't even look at the possibility of anything else being fact factually accurate or anything to that effect. So right. um, it's really important that, yes, we, 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 we understand that people are going to be stupid and say stupid things, but we, we have to allow them the chance. We have to really try to speak to everybody, even if we don't agree with what they're saying. So um, yeah, one, one, one quick <clears throat> comment on that. Sorry, TJ is, you know, it, and it's, it's interesting to me and it's, it's and frustrating that a lot of these conversations are happening on social media when in all actuality, in my opinion, social media is not a real space to have conversations. Like we need to be talking to one another. We need to be a part of group dialogue. And what ends up happening on social media is just binary thought. Well, if you're this way, then you are that. Right. Or if you think this way, then you are that. And I think what we're doing now, you know, I don't, I don't think this podcast is going to change the world. But I think it's just what I want in terms of having conversation and, and actually hashing out like different thoughts and different opinions. Right. Absolutely. Uh, before you go on, last quick mm-hmm. thing before you close this, mm-hmm. uh, TJ, is to that point um, of like you wanting to delete, I think one of the scariest uh, things that's happening right now is that people are aggressively taking the count, the other side of that coin and saying, here's what I'm saying, here's what I think, go ahead, delete me. Like, defriend right. me. And I think that's that. dangerous. I think you yeah. shouldn't be, because that's another form of silencing. I think you should say, here's what yeah. I believe. Here's where I'm at. Here's why. If you'd like to, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Barack Obama yeah. said it so beautifully and poignantly in his, in his farewell speech. And he said, we have such a divided world. And the way to, to, to overcome that division is to have conversations with the other side. Stop having it with your own bubbles. Yep. Stop yep. having it in, in, yep. this, in, this, yeah, in, in this isolated um, – uh, sentiment and, and feeling and, and, and knowledge space, like have right. it outside of that, because that's when you get a better picture, not the entire yeah. picture, but you get a better one. Than you had. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's exactly why I say it's important that we allow those type of people to talk and not silence them in any way, shape or form. That's why I, I didn't, I didn't delete anybody um, as much as I might've wanted right. to. I, <laughs> I didn't delete anybody <laughs> because truth be told, um, it's important to see that there are people who don't agree with you. And it's important to really kind of be checked in that regard. I don't want to walk around thinking that the way I think is the only way to think. 
right? Because that's just not the world that we live in. And that's not the world I would ever want to live in. I want diversity. I want differing opinions, but I also want respect. I want people to be able to do that in a respectful manner and truly allow each other to be different and respect their differences. But respect being the root of all of that needs to be respect. Now, how do we fix it? Um, JC, you mentioned you mentioned change. You mentioned education. And I think that that is 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 so much more crucial than just the amount of money that goes into it. And I know you didn't want to dive too far into that, but I really think that it really is the crux of of a particular movement in that regard is we have to look at the amount of money that's been. We also have to truly dive into what is taught Mm -hmm. in these in these in these classes, because let let me be really honest about one particular thing. And are you both familiar with the the Tulsa massacre in Oklahoma, nineteen twenty one? You know what's crazy about that? I didn't learn about that till I saw okay. Watch Her. So here's my point. Here's my <laughs> point. Right? History is written written by the winner. Right. That doesn't make it accurate. You know, the history that we've read in the textbooks all pointed out. This was like the <laughs> if you look at slavery and racism in a in an American history textbook, it's about as Disney as it can be. It's very uh, <laughs> it's very broad strokes. Yeah. They don't get into the nitty gritty. They don't show anything that doesn't that that doesn't push the agenda of yes, there was racism. Yes, there was segregation, but we moved past it. Abraham Lincoln abolished slavery. Uh, blah 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 blah. Everybody lived happily ever after. Right. Right. Martin Luther King died. We yeah, Rosa Parks after. sat on the back of a bus. Right. That's all we learned about racism in school. Right. Rosa Parks sat on the back of the bus. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Malcolm X believed by any means necessary, so on and so forth. And we got to learn about a couple of different African-American inventors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Malcolm X, by the way, we're told, you know what? That was the wrong way. Yeah, think, that, that, so. You can't do it that really way. You can't, pay attention you can't to do an eye for an <laughs> eye because both people just end up blind, right? right so right, right. we really need to look at what's taught because – to get back to the Tulsa, Oklahoma, I didn't learn about that until I watched Watchmen as well. The fact that this happened, the wall, the massacre of Black Wall Street in 1921, where there were over 10,000 African Americans who were homeless, hundreds of fatalities, thousands of injuries. I didn't know about it. Here I am, a grown man of 34, 33 years of age at the time, not knowing about one of the biggest massacres and or one of the, one of the most blatant massacres and one of the, the, the most vile acts of racism and bigotry in the history of our country. And I found out about it from a TV show at the age of 33, 34 years old. Are you kidding me? So what this right. shows, what this shows is that history is written by the winner and that there is no, well, we, we we won't show them all of that. We, we'll, we'll show them that it was bad, but we're not going to show them exactly how bad it was, right? So I think we need to be educated on what happened. I think we need to be educated on our history to truly understand how not to get back to that point. Um, I think that our our jail systems fail us. Our our mm. our, our, our our penitentiaries are just they're, they're our rehabilitation system is not. I was going to say, are they actually yeah. rehabbing people in those exactly. places? Exactly. That's not what they are. They're isolating. They're, they're turning them into animals. Again, I, I've watched this show 60 Days In, and it, it is it is eye-opening. It is insane. I, I would definitely recommend that as a watch to anybody. Um, so we really need to look at our, 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 our jail system. We need to look at, obviously, again, our police force and, and the vetting process and how we select. Um, but it, it really comes down to... Some jobs you just you just can't have bad apples in. Like you just can't have bad apples in some of these jobs. And if that means that we, our police force has to be uh, vetted even more strictly, more you know, more more stringent, then so be it. Um, but we really have to 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 make sure that we're putting hand, we're putting guns in the hands of people whose job or whose primary objective is to not use that gun. Right. You know, I think the the biggest the way you see if people are going to be good in their positions is like, for instance, you mentioned that a police officer is not a job that you would want. Right. Because you don't know if you, would, you, you wouldn't want that responsibility when, quite frankly, that sounds like the answer of somebody who should be a police officer. Because yep. the chances are, you know, you look at somebody like remember Captain America, uh, he was like, do you want to <laughs> kill Nazis? No, I don't want to go kill anybody. I, I just don't like bullies. Right. Right. You give a man who hasn't had power, power, 
or who doesn't, who, who appreciates power, real power. Mm-hmm. And you pray that they'll, they'll still stay, stay a good man. Right. But you give somebody power who's going to abuse it. Who's never respected the power in the first place. You know, you're not going to get that same outcome. So I think that we just need to be, we need to be much more, uh, decisive on who we allow to do certain jobs. And, um, I mean, there's, there's so much, I, I, I don't know if there's any one thing to start with, but if I had to pick anything, uh, I'd probably go with JC and, and pick education to kind of, to start off with putting people in position to really acquire the knowledge that they need to acquire, be it by having the correct funds and making sure that we're taught the real and not just the Disney version of <laughs> what happened. <laughs> right. We, we, we still haven't seen the Disney slavery movie but no <laughs> you know what i mean like we can't keep getting this cookie cutter this is what slavery was it was cute and blah 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 blah, blah. people died yes but we moved past it you know we're, we're not that people anymore when truth be told is we never stopped right it just changed yeah it's true i mean i i i think back to and i don't know the answer to this about the education piece because you know, we get the we get the version we get in in grade school and high school, and perhaps if you choose to, you can study more of it in college. But the thing is, like, I I don't unless I seeked it out on my own after I like I left school. It wasn't like I was taught this anymore. <laughs> you know, like it it seems like at times it almost it kind of passes, and you're like, oh yeah, I learned about that. But unless you're seeing it all the time, you don't really can comp- you can't really process that it's still happening or that these these incidents happen. So I mean I don't know I don't know the answer to that as far as the the Captain America thing I do I do want to quote the the thing you were trying to quote because it's just a good such a great line from that movie um, he basically tells Captain America why he was chosen he goes because the strong man who has known power all his life may lose respect for that power but a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion and you're absolutely right like I don't want to be a cop <laughs> but, but I, I do agree like we need we need people in those roles that are I guess kind of scared of it and kind of, kind of um, they value they you know, they, they might have been in a position where they were on that side of being on the wrong side right. of things and know that like being on the wrong side of things is something they never want for themselves nor anyone they would ever um, truly care right. about. You know, I, I, yeah. I talked about that show 60 days in and I, I bring it up because I really think it's a fascinating show to watch. But in one of the seasons, there was one who was a cop from a different state. So nobody that anybody in that prison system would ever recognize at the end of their time. in, they made the decision to stop being a police officer. Oh, said after spending wow. time, after spending time in the penitentiary and seeing what we potentially send people to uh, for a little minor, minor things like, you know, drugs or, you know, a small amount of weed, something to that effect. He was like, I can't in good conscience go back to doing this job. I can't in good conscience go back to being a police officer because this is what we're sending them to do. We're sending them to be caged animals and it's not okay. And he, mm. at that point, they decided that they were going to spend the rest of their, their life combating that system, combating the prison system and showing how it doesn't help. It's not helping and trying to find ways to make it better to help really rehabilitate these people as opposed to just having them be locked up animals for the rest of their lives. Um, it really is a fascinating show to, uh, to really watch and dissect. And you can write so many different theories and different papers on it. It's, it's a, it's, it's an awesome show to watch. You know, there's a couple, um, speaking of like stuff to recommend, uh, it's kind of prophetic. I tweeted that I put this out on my Instagram cause I've been super into movies but do the right thing, which came out in 1989 by Spike, a Spike Lee joint. It that deals with this, and it's so prophetic because that was even before the L.A. riots, Rodney King. Um, so that's a good movie if people are looking for things to kind of watch. Uh, as far as like documentaries, I know Let It Fall is really good on Netflix. Uh, the Thirteenth, uh, L.A. 92, um, and then there's a show that I'm gonna watch. Uh, I forget what it's called. It's on Netflix, um, but it's about the Central Park Five. Oh, uh, where it's a doc. It's like when a doc. You see us. When you see us. Yeah. When What's it called? When you see us. When, when when you see us. Yeah. So I mean, in terms of like recommending things for people to like look at, um, those are some things where I, I would say give it a watch if if you're only if you're interested. I'm, yeah. I'm going to throw something out there, um, and I just yeah. watched this for the first time. The Patriot. 
that, I mean, it, that. The Mel Gibson the movie? The Mel Gibson movie. I'm going to throw it out there. It's a very interesting thing about people with differing views. Um, someone that chose inaction because of everything that they saw before that was just tired and weathered in Mel Gibson and then had to take action because it was brought to his doorstep. Uh, and then also, like, the it, it addressed the civil rights. I mean, that was, that was the war that uh, if slaves fought for 12 years, they were given their freedom. And so it's just a very interesting perspective in all the dynamics that happen in between there and all the different people that you encounter within it. Mm. Amen. Yeah, man. Um, well, I want to kind of, re- you know, it looks like we've, we've, we're almost at two hours. We're past two hours at this point, <laughs> or around two hours. Um, and it, it is, it is a weeknight. So we all, I'm sure we all have work the next day, um, or have things to do. You have TJ as a kid. Um, I, but I, I want to just kind of close. You have a wife. Yeah. That, that's important as well. I have, um, I have to eat dinner. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I want to, you know, just, Whatever, what, whatever's on your mind. Final thoughts between the two of you guys um, before we wrap this up. Mm. Yeah, JC, JC or, go, or JC. TJ. I like that you call him yeah, JC, JC. By the way. Like <laughs> <laughs> Justin, you want to start? Um. Yeah, I'll just. And it, it's hard to have. It's hard to summarize everything and just actually. I'll just summarize this. Do your best. Um, I'll summarize exactly what we did today. Um. Tony asked me, again, we've been talking about doing podcasts and like it just didn't happen. And I always talked about the preparation that I need to do because I want to do right by, by Tony and like his show. Um, and then when he said, hey, can we, we can scrap that for now. Uh, would you like to get on uh, the show and like have a conversation about this? And that struck fear in me like you won't believe. Like for the sake that I haven't had a conversation like this for a long time, I've actively avoided it. But uh, Tony just texted me um, during the show. He just goes, hey, so how do you feel um, after doing the show? And I said, good, really good. Um, and, and it's not because we came up with solutions or because like we knocked racism down or we, you know, we, we stuck it to the man. It's more so because we actually had a conversation uh, about perspectives. And um, I think that's one of the most important things to do as, as human beings, because that's how we were built. That's how we were created as social beings. And I don't think it happens enough. And, uh, like, it's definitely something that, uh, I've always held, uh, to be important to me. And I'm just so glad that it's not about trivial things, but it's about real things from real people, um, coming from all different walks. And yeah, I think that's like, that's my takeaway. That's my final thought is like, have more conversations because you can be enlightened in so many other ways. And this is where all of it begins is by having conversations about what can be done, how you feel about it. And, um, and also listening to other people and how they feel about it. Man, amen. I have to, I think for my final thought, it would be to really kind of contradict something that Tony said. Tony said that <laughs> he doesn't know if this show is going to change anything. And I think that and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know if that's exactly what you said, but that's kind of where you were going with it. And, yeah, that's kind of what I said. You know, I, I, I'm going to say this. I think this show is exactly what, what you need. I think that's, this show is exactly what we need. We need a show that people are willing to have conversations and not be, um, not be concerned from the standpoint of not being heard. Like that's something that we really need to be better about as a people is to be able to have conversations and expect to be heard, right? We hope to be heard, but we should expect to be heard because we would, we should offer that same, respect um to people who are speaking right we don't we have this world where everybody talks but nobody really listens nobody really listens and when i say nobody listens communication is is about being able to understand the message that's being sent from this from the sender and being able to understand it and being able to to respond to that information that's given and I feel like we're living in a society where everybody is so quick to want to point out, quick to want to point fingers, quick to want to talk, 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 talk. Nobody's willing to stop and listen and observe and receive and understand and chew on it and, and be able to give them something that's meaningful back. We're just very, very quick to want to, to take in and not be very, very willing to give. And um, my prayer um, for not just this show and not just any you know, media format that we use to talk, but it's just that people truly, truly listen. 
you know, not just listen to what we're saying, but truly take the time to listen to your neighbor, take the time to listen to your, 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 your coworker, um, who you don't know how they're experiencing things. You know, I've had a couple of people reach out to me and just say, Hey, you know, we haven't talked in a while, but I just want you to know that if you need to talk, I'm, I'm here to listen. And that means so much more, you know, just being able to say that somebody has reached out and said that. And these are just, you know, these aren't even Christians that have done. These are just people that I've met over the years that have just, Hey, you know, I can't imagine what it is you're feeling or imagine what it is that you're going through. Imagine what it is that you're, you're thinking right now, but just know that I'm there. And, you know, I also think that it's really important that we recognize the fact that not all cops are bad. You know, we, the media will have Absolutely. it seem like we're painting police officers to be horrible and they're just abhorrent people and et cetera, et cetera. No, the vast majority of police officers are good. I remember the first time I got pulled over uh, by a white cop in Aurora, Illinois. And I can't think of the guy's name, but I'll never forget his birthday because we share the same birthday. Um, he says, I can't give you a ticket because we, we share the same birthday, but just slow down. Uh, I was a white guy. I, I never forget, but, um, it was the coolest thing, man. Cause it's like, you know, we have nothing in common other than the fact that we share a birthday. You know, I'm a young black guy. He's an old white guy. And, you know, he'd have every reason to give me a ticket. I think I was doing, I was on, uh, 59. I was on 59th street and just flying. Right. And he had every reason to give me a ticket, but he didn't. He didn't. And, um, it was just for the simple fact that he found a common thread. And if we all just stopped and listened and took the time to find a common thread among us, we get so much further. We've all got a common thread. We just got to figure it out what it is and build off of that. So that's, 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 that's my final thought. I'll, I'll just by ra- wrap up by saying, kind of wrapping up in and talking about the intent of this show and hopefully what, you know, what kind of comes out of it um, for anyone that listens and, and for anyone that, um, you know, has actually taken the time to listen. I think it is, it is important that um, the intent of this was to have a conversation as we've all kind of echoed um, with Justin. Um, me and him have had plenty of conversations throughout our life, uh, but we've never really talked about this kind of stuff. So, although we're, we're like really good friends, it's, it is important to even like have these conversations with your close friends that maybe you don't, um, talk about these things with just to get that perspective. So I'm appreciative of the fact that Justin came on. I also think it was important to have TJ on because TJ doesn't, you know, I'm, I know TJ, but we're not like best of friends. We don't, we've never actually even met. Um, TJ is also black, which I think is important to have another perspective on this. Justin and TJ have never met. So I think it's just, I wanted to show the the importance of not only having conversations, but having conversations with, at this point, we we don't really know each other all that well the, between the three of us. And we still were able to have a productive conversation that I think um, that anyone listens to can can come out of and go, there are clear ways to help. These guys all listen to one each, one another. And they've all probably maybe grown a little bit from this. And I hope that people can listen to this and take this and potentially have conversations with other people and potentially grow from this as well. So hopefully that happened. Yeah. And I appreciate both of you guys hey, man, coming bro. on. Thanks for putting this together, man. This is, this is very, very much needed. Thank you. <laughs>